My goal today is to prepare your hearts for Advent, all right? He's going to prepare your hearts for Christmas. I'm going to prepare you for Advent uh, to give you the proper focus as you go through that series. Now, to do that, I want to read Hebrews chapter 9, and I'm going to really start in verse 22, all right? The writer says this, And according to the law, almost all things are purified or cleansed with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Referring back to the Levitical system when animal sacrifices had to be made, blood shed, all right, for the forgiveness or the cleansing of sin. Therefore it was necessary, verse 23, that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these. In other words, that the temple was built under the instructions of God, the worship system implemented, and sacrifices made, all right, here upon earth for covering the sins of Israel. But he also adds, but the heavenly things themselves need better sacrifices. In other words, he's saying that for an eternal sacrifice to cover the sins of men for all eternity, it's not going to be with a bull, it's not going to be with a lamb. And he ends up going on for Christ, who is that sacrifice, has entered, has not entered the holy place made with hands. All right, as our high priest, he did not enter the holy place here, which are copies of the true, but he entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood of another. The holy priest had to go every year, the day of atonement, to offer sacrifice. He says he then, Christ, would have had to suffer since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The perfect sacrifice, the eternal sacrifice, to pay for your sins and my sins, past, present, and future, for all eternity. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment... So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. And notice the last two words. He will appear for salvation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as we go into your word. Dear Lord, I pray that you would illumine our eyes that we would see your truth. And dear Holy Spirit, I pray that you would pierce that truth within our very beings, dear Lord, that we, all right, would be looking for the appearing of our Savior, and that our hearts would be prepared, and that we would be, dear Lord, heralding that a Savior has come. So I pray, dear Lord, that your will would be done in each of our lives this morning, for I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, in the verses that we read, you have three wonderful statements for the child of God. The first statement is in verse 28, the first part of it, that Christ has appeared. We're getting ready to celebrate uh, Christmas. That's what this is all about. It says, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Jesus Christ came to this world, was born already of a virgin in Bethlehem, wrapped in swaddling bands, very similar to the bands that a body was wrapped in. And he came for the purpose that he would die for your sins and for my sins. So Christ has appeared, all right, to bear the sins of many. But then it says in verse 24 that Christ not only has appeared, but Christ is, in the present tense, appearing. Christ has entered into heaven itself, verse 24 says, now to appear. Your advocate is my advocate. He's appealing, all right, for you and me as children of Almighty God. And then the third statement in verse 28, the last part of that verse, it says Christ is going to appear. It says that he will appear the second time apart from sin unto salvation. Jesus Christ is coming again. Now, those of us that are Christians, we're to be looking for the third appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, known as the second coming. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, 
that we are to be eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just like I know when raising our kids, when Christmas time came, there was no way you could keep them in bed, right? I mean, they were up, man, before the crack of dawn, they were eagerly waiting their what? Presents, right? What, what we were giving them. And the same way as a child of God, we are to be eagerly, Paul says, awaiting the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But the sad thing is, is that many Christians are in the dark about Christ's second coming. But it's a truth that is proclaimed throughout the Word of God. There are 1,845 references in the Old Testament to the fact that Jesus is coming again. In the New Testament, New Testament has 260 chapters. There are 318 references to Jesus coming the second time. That means one out of every 30 verses that you would read in the New Testament, all right, is testifying that Jesus Christ is coming again. Uh, we are to be awaiting that coming. Now, just to give you a little background, the second coming of Christ is comprised of two events, and I put this on your outline. The first event we know as the rapture, and you probably have heard that word, uh, really the catching away is what that phrase means, the catching away of the church or those who uh, put their faith in Jesus Christ. And it is at this time that Christ will come in the clouds, Paul says, and that the church will rise to meet him. The verses that talk about this are in Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. And let me read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that you'll he hear these verses many times at funerals, all right? And it says in verse 13, I don't want you to be ignorant, all right, or in the dark, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or those that have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. In other words, as a Christian, we sorrow, but our sorrow is encompassed by hope. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep, all right, with Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and it says, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. See, as a Christian, we're waiting to hear that trumpet, the voice of the archangel to be caught up uh, to meet the Lord in the air. This is our blessed hope. In fact, Paul talks about this in the book of Titus, our blessed hope is that Jesus is coming again and we are going to be caught up to meet him with those who have died in the Lord. Also, he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, that's to be our comfort in life. Our comfort in this life is not that everything is going to go our way, but our comfort in life is that our Savior is coming again and that we are going to meet him. So the first event, all right, in the coming of the Lord is what we call the rapture. That's what we're waiting for. But the second event is when Jesus actually returns to this earth. See, in the rapture, Jesus is in the clouds. Seven years later, he'll return to this earth. His feet will return to the Mount of Olives from where he left. And he will establish his kingdom, the millennial kingdom. Revelation chapter 19, Paul was given a vision of that starting in verse 11. And he says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed with fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, Psalm chapter 2 talks about this. He himself treads the winepress 
of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, he'll return to this earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, the first time he appeared, and we're getting ready to celebrate Christmas, he came as an infant son of a young virgin. The second time he's coming, you read the verses, he comes as the Lord of battle. The first time the angels announced his birth. The second time it says the armies of heaven will be with him. The first time he had no place to lay his head. But the second time it says that his residence will be in a palace there in Jerusalem. At his first appearing, the enemy said, We will not have this man to rule over us. But at his second appearing, the book of Revelation says that he shall reign forever and ever. At his first appearing, he was crowned with a crown of thorns. At the second appearing, he'll be crowned with the crown of this universe. At his first appearance, they smote him with their hands. At his second appearing, they will cry for the rocks and for the mountains to hide them from this one who has come. The first time men heard the cry of a baby. The second time it says that Christ will descend from heaven with a shout of the archangel. The first time he came by a birth that very few people saw. But the second time it says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also that pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now this morning, I want to look at three truths concerning the Lord's coming. See, I believe as a Christian, we're not to be looking for death. We're to be looking for him. All right? And I think to have the proper focus on Christmas, we need to have the proper focus, all right, on a returning Savior. So I want to give you this morning quickly what the second coming means to a child of God, what it would mean to the lost man, and what our responsibility is in light of that. Now, I said Paul makes two statements in his epistles. He says the second coming, all right, is to be a message of hope to a Christian and a message of comfort to the believer. So he says it means hope, all right? We as Christians, as we live in this earth, no matter what would come our way, that we are to live in hope. And that hope is rooted in a coming Savior. So let me give you a couple of thoughts. I have three of them. Number one, the hope that we have is that we may not experience death. You ever realize that? You may not have to die. Paul wrote to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. He says, I, I tell you a mystery, or I give you a secret truth. We shall not all sleep. We shall not all die. Now, see, up to that time, all right, only two men did not experience death. One of them was the man Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, taken away into heaven by the chariot. And the other was a man by the name of Enoch, who walked with God, and God took him into his presence. Now, everyone else, we expect to die. You know, the survey is, is like, you know, one out of one, all right, are going to experience death. Death in everyone's future. No way out of it. But literally what Paul was saying, there is the possibility. There is going to be a generation. There is going to be a group of believers that will not die. Because, see, the rapture is going to happen at a given generation or a given time. That means if he would return in our lifetime, we would not have to experience death. I don't have to wait for death. I can wait for something to happen other than his death. I can wait for his coming. I like the quote, there was a, was a preacher years ago, G. Camel Morgan, British pastor, he says this, I never begin my work in the morning without thinking that God may perhaps interrupt my work for his. And he says, I am not looking for death I'm looking for him. See, when we celebrate Christmas, we think of many times about the Magi, all right, who looked into heaven for his star, and they looked for this new king, and they pursued him. 
Well, just as the Magi looked into heavens for the coming, the birth of the Savior, that we as believers, we are to what? Look for him. So we have the hope that we might not have to experience death. Now, can I say, there's nothing pretty about death, all right? So I, I, I would love to be in that generation. I would love to be in that group of people. We were not created by God to experience death. Death came because of sin. But we have the hope because of a coming Savior that we might not have to experience death. But also we have a hope that we're going to see our loved ones again, that we're going to see our friends again. I read the verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where it said, Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up together with them in the clouds that we will meet, we referring to those that have came, all right, from the graves, reunited with our soul, and those that are alive, bodies change instantly, will meet in the clouds, and it says we will meet the Lord in the air. Now, when we go to a cemetery, if you have a loved one who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we know where our loved ones are, am I right? The Word of God says we're confident, I say, rather willing to be absent from the body and to be what? Present with the Lord. Now, they're not there in a physical body, right? Their spirit, their soul is with God, and their bodies are buried, all right, in that burial plot. There's only one who is in heaven with a body, a physical body. And who was that? That's Jesus Christ in a glorified physical body. But it says that at his coming, they are going to come with the Lord, their spirit, their souls, and it says they're going to return with him, and it says their bodies are going to come forth from their resting place, a resurrected body in the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, united together, and it says that we will be caught up together and meet them in the clouds. Now, I don't know about you, but the greatest thing about Thanksgiving and the holidays is to be with family and to be with friends, all right, is, is reunions. Can I say that there is going to be the biggest reunion that you have ever experienced in your life if you are a believer, all right? Either if you are with him and returning or you're upon this earth and translate it up to meet them in the clouds, but we're going to have a grand reunion. The hope that we're, when we go to a cemetery, whether it's a believing parent or child, whoever it is, we are going to see that loved one again. This earth is not all there is. Paul says that's our hope. He says we're to live in light of that hope. But I can say there's another hope. And I tried to point it out when I was reading uh, in our verses this morning, Hebrews chapter 9. We have the hope of God's completed work in our lives. There's a verse in the book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 that says this. Being confident, speaking that we are confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, when you get saved, I get saved, put our faith trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes within us. And there, God literally, all right, is beginning a work in our lives that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, guess what? That hasn't been completed yet, has it? In other words, man, I am not like Jesus. I, hopefully, I'm more uh, like my Savior today than I was when I got saved, all right? But the work is going to be completed when? When we see Jesus. Can I say that our God does not leave anything half done? That's why in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, it said this. And I'll give you the NIV. It says, he will appear a second time, not to bear sin. He's not coming to die on the cross. But to bring salvation to those that are waiting for him. We go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You mean he's coming to bring me salvation? I thought I already was saved. Well, we are, all right? But the results of that salvation have not been fully experienced in our life. See, my, my body is not, a, I, I still feel pain, all right? I'm still tempted to sin. I don't know about you, all right? 
I find that many times I'm not only tempted, I actually what? Give in to that temptation. But it's saying that my Lord is going to return and he's going to complete the work that's been begun in our lives. Sometimes I try to, what in the world would it be like to live in a body with no pain? What would it be like to live in a body, not even be tempted to sin, right? I mean, I, I cannot fathom that. That's why the Bible says, in other words, ear has not heard, eye has not seen, neither enter into heart of man what God has prepared. I sometimes like to look at it like, is that, you know, we get to heaven and die and look, Bill, is that you? <laughs> man, what happened to you, right? In a good way, all right? What happened is my Lord completed the work that was begun in my life. Paul says, man, we have that hope. Hope I might not die. I might be caught to get up in the clouds to meet him in the air. The hope that I'm going to see my loved ones again. The hope that God's going to complete the work that he started in my life. But not only is it hope, but it's comfort. He said that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I've kind of already mentioned this. It's the comfort of a changed body. You people that are young don't understand this. All right? <laughs> there was a lot of verses in the Bible I didn't understand until I got older. I would read, you know, the verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, we in this tent do groan. Tent means body, all right? Never understood that. But as you get older, you understand because this body does start to groan, all right? I mean, it groans in the morning, it groans at night, right? And uh, I have the comfort that this body's going to be changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51, all right, it says that we're not all going to sleep, not all going to die, but it says we shall, A-L-L, -L, all be changed. Paul not only states we might not need to die, but we're not going to live forever in this mortal body. Now, why would that be? See, picture it. If I'm going to live with him, all right, in a recreated earth, in heaven, I sure don't want to go with this body, all right? God's going to have to give me a new body that is fit for a new heaven, all right? And Paul says, that's the comfort. You're not going to go. I wouldn't be able. To. You could not. I could not enjoy heaven in this body, all right? I got to have a new body. And this is really the promise that we have. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, he says, our body is going to be indestructible or incorruptible. And literally in that Greek, it means absence of decay and absence of weakness. No weakness, no decay, no, nothing that would inhibit what God's perfect will was for us. You know, I used to think when I first got saved, you know, you would look at all these cartoons, you knew that people, you know, um, you know, picturing heaven as somebody on a cloud floating around as a spirit of wings. You understand that's not the way it's going to be, all right? All right, God's going to recreate this world, all right? I mean, if you thought the description of Eden was great, you go to the book of Revelation, see what he describes it, all right? And God created man not as a spirit, but he created man, what, as a three-part being, body, spirit, and soul. And you understand his plan was that we would always have a, what, physical body, all right? The reason we are in the problems in this body today is because of sin. But one day we're going to be in the new kingdom with a new resurrected body just like who? Jesus. He's our first fruits, the Word of God says. And that we have the promise of a changed body. No matter what type of body you have now, your future body is going to be like the Lord's. Listen, he says in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the children of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So when you look in the mirror as you get older or, and you get discouraged at what you see, understand that's all going to pass away, all right? That this body is going to be changed. Not only a new heaven, but a new resurrected body. 
So that's the comfort. I don't have to drag this body around forever, all right? Number two, the comfort, all right, of a future without separation. When I was reading there in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says we're going to be gathered up in the clouds with them, and then it says to meet the Lord in the air, and it adds these words, and so we will always be with the Lord. You live long enough, you understand what life is. Tell me if I'm wrong on this. Life is a big series of goodbyes. People come in your life, people leave your life. Sometimes those goodbyes are very, very difficult. You understand heaven, eternity, is going to be a place where we're not going to have to say goodbye. There's no goodbyes in glory. That's a tremendous, tremendous thought. No separation from loved ones ever again in the Lord. And we're going to end up seeing the one who's, you know, we see by the eyes of faith, we're going to see literally with eyes our Lord and Savior. The same one John saw, the same one Peter saw, as he appeared after his rest, you and I are going to see. And Paul says, man, that's our comfort. So as, as a believer, as we come into Christmas time, I'm not looking back. In fact, there's nowhere in the Bible that tells us to celebrate Christmas. It tells us we're not to look back, we're to look forward. The greatest things ahead are ahead in your life, all right? All of us, if you're a child of God, you have a future beyond what you could ever understand. Don't project your future in this world. Project your future as pictured in the Word of God. But yet the Bible says what this means for the lost person. People that we come in contact day in and day out that have not put their faith and trust in, the, in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It means that their future is a future not with hope, but a future what? Without hope. Instead of the first resurrection, it'll be the second resurrection. Remember we said when Christ returns in the rapture, those that have died in the Lord are resurrected from the grave to meet their soul all right, and reunite it, and that we're going to be with them in the Lord? Well, there's a second resurrection, all right? Not all those, all right, are going to be resurrected at the same time. See, here, here, here's a reality that many people miss in the Word of God. You're going to live forever. I don't care whether you're saved or unsaved. I like what Dr. Bob Jones Sr. used to say when I, I went one year at Bob Jones University. He was an old, old-time preacher, all right? He said, you will not cease to exist. You'll cease to exist when crepe is draped over heaven and angels sing funeral dirges over the grave of God. You understand whether saved or lost, you're going to live forever. The question is, will you be with God or separated from God for all eternity? Revelation 20 verse 5 says, the rest of the dead, speaking about those who have died, live not again until the thousand years were finished. That is the first resurrection. What it is saying at the second resurrection, which takes place, all right, after, all right, the millennium, it talks about in, in Revelation chapter 20, let me read the verses. He says, I saw a great white throne, him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in those books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to their works. Well, it says there's coming a day at the end of Christ's millennial kingdom that there's going to be a resurrection of all those that have died and not put their faith and trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, it says when a person who was lost leaves this earth, their soul, body, goes in the grave, just like a believer's, but their soul separated from God in a place called hell. And it says at this second resurrection, their spirit is going to be brought up, all right? And it says that their body is going to be resurrected, united, and they're going to stand before God. And everybody's going to have their day of reckoning, all right, if they're lost. And they'll be judged according to their what? 
the book of life, the works, what you've done. God is a just and righteous God. Now think about it. I don't know about you. If I was judged on my life of everything I did, everything I said, everything I thought, I would have no hope, absolutely none, all right? And this is what is talking, no hope that they would have. Also, no comfort, because instead of eternal life, it's going to be eternal what? Separation. See, death is separation. Remember when God, speaking to Adam and Eve, you know, stay away from the tree. That you eat of it, you will surely what? Die. Well, I read that Adam and Eve partook of that fruit. Did they just fall over and die? No. But they were what? Separated from God. See, death means separation. All right? Life means unification. Jesus Christ came that I would no longer need to be separated from God. But it says those who have rejected him, they'll be separated for all eternity from God. In fact, in Revelation chapter 20, at the end of that chapter, it says death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Ends up in eternal sin. That is the scariest thing, all right? That should drive us, all right, again, that we would share a risen Savior. Now, in light of those things, let me end and just tell you what our responsibility is, all right? See, I believe as a Christian we have a responsibility in light of what God has given us, the hope, all right, and the comfort he has given us. Number one, my responsibility is that I would live a life of anticipation, you understand it's a sin against God to live a life that is constantly complaining, woe is me, poor little me, what I don't have, how bad my life is. You understand God gave his son that he would pay the price that you could have a future beyond what you could ever comprehend. And we are to live in anticipation of his coming. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9, 28 says, Unto them that look for him, <coughs> he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We are to make our looking for him a vital part of our life. Number one, it shows what's important to us. Now think about this. We all look for a lot of things, don't we? Man, I go on vacation. I look forward to vacation, all right? I look forward to playing around the golf. I look forward to getting together with family and everything else. Can I say? Because they're important to me, all right? Do we ever look for him? We need to look for him for his support, and it shows our faith in the word of God. Just as the wise men years ago, just as the shepherds went into that city and looked for the Savior, we're to be looking for the Savior. According, in fact, this is how Peter writes it in 2 Peter 3.13. It says, according to his promise, we look. That means if we're not looking for him, we're, we're living a life that displays no faith. So I'm to live a life and anticipate. I'm celebrating Christmas. But guess what? There's going to be no Christmas celebration in heaven. It's going to be Thanksgiving. You realize that's the only holiday that is celebrated. You can read about in the book of Zechariah. Only holiday that you will celebrate in heaven is Thanksgiving. You realize that all the nations of the earth are going to come and offer him Thanksgiving. And us as the redeemed have more, really, to end up give thanks than anyone. So anticipation number two, all right, I need to be prepared for his coming. 1 John 3, verse 2 and 3 says this, Beloved, now we're the children of God. And it does not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know when he is revealed, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then he adds this. And everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. He said, if we believe that Christ is coming back, then that should motivate us for being what? Ready. I still remember as a boy, all right? My dad was, we lived in a small house. There was five boys, and we had a basement. I don't know what it was, but my dad had to have the basement. I mean, always cleaned, always perfect, all right? 
Dad was a big man, way bigger than me. He was a heavyweight uh, fo- uh, boxer, all right? And it ended up that we knew he was coming back, all right, home after he was done work. And if you were looking at house at the boys about one hour before 5 o'clock, you saw us running, man, to get that police spick and span down there. Because you knew Dad was coming in the side door, and if he told us to do it, going downstairs. Can I say this? Jesus is coming again. All right? Now, you're not, we won't lose our salvation. God's not going to punish us. But I sure don't want to hang my head in shame that I'm not prepared to meet him. All right? In other words, there's something about if I know, all right, he's coming, I want to be prepared to meet the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that should motivate it. The reason many are not excited about their faith, they're not living right, not looking for Christ to come in their lifetime. Realize any moment, according to the word of God, the shout, the trump of God, the voice dark angel could break up the heavens and Christ could come. So I said we live in anticipation, prepared for his coming. But the third thing, I'm to proclaim a risen and coming Savior. I'm to show people how to escape the second death, the second resurrection. Can I share something with you that I believe, all right? The Word of God tells us that God's going to wipe away every tear in heaven, that there'll be no sadness or tears. Why would God have to wipe away tears in heaven? Many Bible scholars believe that when the second, resur- second resurrection occurs and the people are judged according to their works, that those who who are saved, put their faith and trust in God, we are going to view that. Now you think about it for a second. If I had to view somebody that I knew worked by me in a cubicle, being judged of God and eternally separated from him, and I, I try to picture in mind that that person would look at me, maybe not say the words, but why didn't you ever share? Why didn't you ever tell me? I believe there's going to be regrets as we enter in, but he's going to wipe away every tear. See, I have a responsibility to share what my hope is in this life and what the comfort is that God gives me in this life. I have a responsibility. You know, many times the devil tries to do, but, oh, if you share, in other words, they're going to make fun of you. They're going to, it really doesn't matter that we share out of love and out of compassion. So I guess the message this morning is Christmas Don't let your focus be backward, but let it be forward. The best times are not in the back, but they're ahead. We live in hope and comfort of a coming Savior. I live in anticipation. Live a life of commitment prepared for Him. And to live proclaiming, you know what? That Savior that was born in Bethlehem, He's coming again to this earth. But not as a babe, but as a king to redeem this earth and redeem all creation back to himself. And I'll end with the verses of Jesus. Jesus told his disciples and he tells us, keep watch, keep watch, for you do not know the day and you do not know the hour. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Maybe you're here this morning. I don't want to take anything for granted. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not ready to meet God. If what I have talked about this morning would happen this afternoon, if the trump of God would sound and those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ would be resurrected, you say, Preacher, I've never put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. This morning we invite you to, to put your trust and faith in Him that by his sacrifice on Calvary, your sins were paid. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a believer, but you're not ready to meet him. For, there's some things in your life that are just, just not right. You need to get some things taken care of. You're not living in anticipation of his coming. In fact, you're hoping that he would delay his coming. Maybe God's touching your heart. You have somebody that's close to you. Somebody you work with every day, somebody you live next to, that they have no hope, no comfort, no eternal hope, no eternal comfort. 
And you have never once even attempted to share the message of a Savior with Him. Maybe the Holy Spirit touching your heart and you just need to come this morning and pray, God, give me the opportunity that I be able to share Jesus with them. And then whatever need it is, maybe you're going through a difficult time right here and now. Maybe by faith you just need to come to this altar and say, Lord, I thank you that this is not going to last forever. That night's going to pass and morning is going to come. The eternal morning, the eternal day. And that I'm going to trust you and I'm going to worship you and praise you for what lies ahead. I'm going to ask if everyone would stand. Everybody standing, heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to ask that we play as we do every Sunday. A song of invitation if God has touched your heart about anything this morning. This altar is open that you could come. Bow your knee before the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's there to listen. Dear Heavenly Father, have your way.